اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل لغدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي all praise is for Allah for all his blessings for all his blessings uncounted blessings subhanallah wa bihamdi adad khalqi wa riza nafsi wa zinat arshi wa midad kalimatihi glory and praise and, and praise be to Allah as much as the number of his creation as much as pleases him as much as the weight of his throne and as much as the ink of his words today we have a special dua special dua for everybody actually but uh, especially in the last uh, few days we lost a dear brother who reported to rcc on the 1st of february possibly um, nearly all of us reported on the 1st of february few reported on 2nd few reported on 3rd as far as I know, but uh, the official reporting date was 1st of February, and I'm sure Iqbal Mehdi was amongst those who gathered on the plains of Mukhtarpur on 2nd of February onwards for the next nine days to be drilled for parade, inaugural day parade before the chief guest. So we, he, he passed away in uh, Karachi. We will uh, pray for him and for all our near and dear ones. And we will uh, remember him, inshallah, if any brother wants to uh, rec uh, re recall his memory after the prayers. And then uh, we will have a special uh, session for those who are more serious. And uh, today, Tawhid is busy uh, in his exams. So Major General Jahangir Kabir Talukdar, also ambassador, he will uh, make a presentation. So we have been talking about, actually I started talking about, uh, or, or wanted to talk about uh, some of the sunnahs of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his daily life or from his daily life but then I, I thought, first of all, uh, I, should, I should talk about the importance, paramount importance of Sunnah, uh, establish that from Quran, first and foremost, uh, to, to, to drive home the point that it is uh, based on the commandment of Allah, that we obey Allah and obey His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we spent two halakas on that, and uh, then I wanted to go over, uh, because uh, some people have doubts about hadith, how authentic they are. So I wanted to go over the process of uh, collection of hadith, uh, authenticating hadith, compiling them. So there were, uh, the third session was on that, and the fourth and the fifth on the four schools of Islamic uh, jurisprudence, the Hanafi, the Maliki, the uh, Shafi, and the Hanbali schools. And then uh, the sixth session was on why there are differences in the four schools. And the seventh session was, then I wanted to talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, um, Siyar Sitta authors, the six authentic books, the authors of them, starting with Imam Bukhari, Seventh session, eighth on Imam Mus Imams Muslim and Abu Daud, ninth on Imam An Nasai and At Tirmidhi, and today is the last of the six uh, Imams. Uh, and then I want to uh, mention a few other uh, scholars who also expanded our horizon on authentic Hadith, and then um, uh, summarize what we went over in the last, uh, starting with Imam Bukhari, uh, actually uh, in the last uh, one, two, three, four, five halakas, five out of the 10 halakas, uh, starting with uh, the four Imams and then the six uh, uh, authors of the Siya Sitta, six uh, authentic books. So that is 10 summarized based on what we uh, 
talked about in terms of uh, these 10 uh, great scholars. And then uh, what did I learn based on my reflection? Um, I, I, I went through on average uh, four or five biographies on each one of them. Uh, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, it was uh, eye-opening for me that, uh, and also at the same time, you know, when you read about them, you get to know about so many others who were involved in that process of, of collecting hadith and learning hadith and memorizing hadith and uh, trying to uh, authenticate hadith, hadith experts. Uh, it has a tremendous uh, impact on, uh, on you. So uh, some of my learnings. So Almighty Allah, you know, he chose some people uh, to be the torch bearers of knowledge. And that has illuminated our understanding of, of uh, Siratul Mustaqim using both Quran and authenticated uh, traditions. And these scholars, they devoted their entire life going beyond uh, the call of duty uh, and also teaching people, writing books. And they are the true inheritors of the Prophet of, of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not leave worldly wealth. He left, which is infinitely more valuable than worldly wealth. And that is ilm that uh, connects us or can connect us with the creator following his sunnah. So Ibn Maja is the last in that series and uh, his full name, Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Yazid Ibn Abdullah Ibn Maja Ar-Rabi Al-Kazwini. The last one is this is this place from where he comes. And the one before that, Ibn Maja is supposed to be the name of his uh, tribe. But in this case, it is not the name of his tribe. He was born in the same year that Imam Tirmizi was born. But he, uh, Imam uh, uh, Tirmizi was born in Tirmiz uh, in, uh, in uh, Turkmenistan not very far from Kazwin, where Imam, Imam Ibn Majah was born the same year. <coughs> and like all the other Imams, he was born in a practicing family, practicing in worshiping as well as in acquiring knowledge and in uh, disseminating knowledge. His home city, uh, there's a story behind it, was conquered uh, during the first four Khalifas, Uthman ibn Afwan, uh, the third Khalifa, uh, during his time in 24 Hijri. And uh, one of the companions, famous companion, Al-Bara ibn Azib became governor, was appointed governor. And uh, because of this governor, Kazvin transformed into a center of knowledge and scientific activity starting 24, uh, a, a year, uh, 24 Hijri, and uh, Ibn Majah was born, uh, let's say, 180 years after that. So this was a bustling city, bustling with uh, knowledge of all sorts. So this is Iran and uh, the province of Kazvin in red, and uh, the city of Kazvin in, in uh, more uh, in closer detail. Uh, Iran is a beautiful place in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, religious monuments, masjids. And this is in a village, right in the mid village. Beautiful masjid in a village, and this is modern uh, Tejarat Tower in Kazvin, meaning business uh, tower. Chamber of Commerce, possibly, and uh, a, a bird's eye view of the city, um, bustling, but not a metropolis. <laughs> His birth, real name is Muhammad, the name of three out of the six Imams of Siyasitta, who were all familiar 
by their kunya nickname, except Imam Muslim. Three, there are three reports on why uh, Ibn Majah or Muhammad was known as Ibn Majah. One is that uh, his mother's name was Ibn Majah. The other is that his father's name was Ibn Majah. Uh, his father's name was Majah or mother's name was Maja. And the third opinion is his great-grandfather's name was Maja. Uh, scholars say, as I read from five different biographies, uh, that uh, uh, most likely his father's name was Maja. So then hence he came to be known as Ibn Maja. And uh, interestingly, and very interestingly, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, from the progeny of uh, one of the most uh, illustrious Companion, companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salman Farsi, who traveled from Kazwin and uh, uh, went to different places in search of truth, the true religion. He became a, um, a Majus, then he became a Christian. Uh, and then the, a Christian monk told him about the coming of uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. So he waited in Medina for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that was uh, ancestor of uh, Ibn Majah. Uh, it, it, is, it goes without saying that I use the term Imam every time I say Ibn Majah and Rahmatullah Alayhi. Just to save time, I'm not uttering them every time. Imam at Tirmizi, uh, as I said, was also born in the same year and they were close acquaintances. The biographies do not say that they were close friends, meaning that they traveled together uh, in search of knowledge uh, in, to, to, to different places on several occasions. His education started learning at a very early age, supervised by parents. Then until the age of 21, completed his education under all major scholars of his, of his city. And, and this was a bustling city. And from 230 Hijri, uh, when he was about 21 or 22, the Imam started his educational journeys and visited Basra, Kufa, Baghdad, Makkah, Sham, uh, Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, Lebanon, and nowadays uh, Israel. Uh, Rai, that's Tehran's old name, Egypt, cities in Egypt, Hejaz, cities in Hejaz, Khurasan, cities in Khurasan, Damascus, Damascus, Nishapur, uh, where there was a big, um, great scholar. I mean, I shouldn't use the term great scholar, a famous scholar, uh, who, uh, under whom Imam Bukhari also learned, and hymns. <laughs> he studied under Allah knows best, uh, as mentioned, 319 scholars, uh, mentioned in one source, <clears throat> and this is uh, the trip from just one of his trips from Kazwin to Makkah. If he went straight, it would have it's 25, 27, 600 kilometers. And if somebody travels 29 hours, is uh, if you travel by a car today in the highway, there were no highways in those days. Uh, it's all, as I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, it's all uh, desert sometimes and mountains sometimes and uh, rough terrain, uh, all sorts of terrain. And uh, if you traveled, let's say, or if you travel today 40 kilometers per day, it would have taken you about over two months, 64 days or so. Uh, and he went to so many places. So according to the famous historian Ibn Kathir, Ibn Majah was a student of Imam Abu Daud. And he had so many other uh, famous scholars under whom he uh, uh, learned ilm. Uh, one of them was Abu, Musa, Abu Musab Az-Zuhri, who was a student of Imam Malik, and Rabi ibn Suleiman, who was a student of Imam Shafi. Another giant scholar was Muhammad ibn Yahya Ad-Duhli in, uh, in Nishapur. I was mentioning about him. Imam Bukhari was, uh, I, 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 I misspoke actually. Imam Bukhari was not a student. Imam Bukhari went when to Nishapur when uh, Muhammad ibn uh, Yahya al-Duhli was the most famous uh, uh, scholar. Imam Bukhari went at that time to Nishapur. Uh, so al-Duhli was also a teacher of Imam ibn Majah. And then he, uh, after about 14, 
15 years of trouble and education. He settled in Kazween, as some of them did, went back to their base. Not everybody, but some of them. Many, he had many students of knowledge who studied uh, at his feet and narrated hadith from him uh, and became exemplary scholars. And this is a very uh, important part for me. Uh, so they became exemplary scholars, his students, or the next generation who taught the next generation and they taught the next generation. And this system will continue until the day of judgment. Whatever you and me are doing, how long will it last? We die and everything stops. But whatever these people did, knowledge is such a thing that you impart, you learn and you impart to others, even one hadith, and that person imparts to others and to others, this can continue until the day of judgment and your book of deeds will be open until the day of judgment, if that happens, if that's what you pursue, the importance of knowledge, acquiring and disseminating. Abu Huraira, actually it is knowledge that can bring us closer to Allah Ta'ala, can enable us to know Allah Ta'ala, to know his commandments, to know the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, to communicate that, to practice on that and to communicate that, so that has, uh, that, that, that can last, the effect of that can last until the day of judgment, potentially. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is a quote of, of uh, about knowledge from uh, Ibn Majah. The best of charity is when a Muslim man gains knowledge, then he teaches it to his Muslim brother, who in turn teaches it to others and so on and so forth. From Sunan Ibn Majah. I, I will bypass this one for the sake of time. Another hadith from, uh, from uh, Ibn Majah about knowledge. The books by uh, Ibn Majah, the Imam acquired vast knowledge. In multiple branches of deen, he wrote books on hadith, tafsir, and the his and history. Uh, these were his his uh, uh, specialties. He was a muhaddith, hafiz of hadith. He was hafiz of Quran, and he was a historian. And uh, his uh, book on history of narrators of hadith is no longer available. And I'll mention why it is no longer available. And Ibn Kathir may be mentioning about this book on narrators of hadith, or he may be mentioning about another book on uh, Ibn Majah's book on history, uh, in which he mentions that it's a great history book and a manifestation of his great scholarship. Ibn Majah's great scholarship and learning. So this is what Ibn Kathir said, and he called, he called it complete history. Ibn Kathir read it, but we cannot read it. The Mongols destroyed it. And another book that the Mongols destroyed and thousands and thousands of other books that the Mongols destroyed in different centers of ilm that they captured and demolished, burned to ashes. Uh, thousands upon thousands of books are lost. We would have been much more richer if that Allah Ta'ala did not cause that to happen. There was a reason for which Allah Ta'ala caused that to happen. Nothing happens without the will of Allah. So the other book is Book of Tafsir, in which he collected ahadith and comments of companions about various ayah of the Quran and Tabi'in, Tabi'in, who, who saw the, the, the Sahaba, in, suppo uh, uh, in supported uh, and is supported with chains of narrations. But unfortunately, it was destroyed by the Mongols. The Barbarians. Imam Ibn Majah is best known for his book, Sunan Ibn Majah. Fortunately, you know, Allah Ta'ala caused books of hadith to be saved, preserved. Not all of them, but at least the, the six uh, canonical books 
uh, were not, or even, even uh, some of them were destroyed, some of them were preserved by Allah Ta'ala. Because he wanted us to act on Quran and Sunnah. Without Sunnah, we would not know how to act on every commandments of Allah Ta'ala. So Allah Ta'ala had to preserve authentic traditions somewhere. And you see, these, these Mongols destroyed uh, the tafsir of Ibn Majah, but his, uh, his uh, Sunan uh, was, was preserved. They destroyed his history book, but his Sunan was preserved. And in this book, he looked at Allah knows best. This 100,000 ahadith, I, I um, uh, presume it would be more than 100,000. Because from all his troubles, he must have gathered much more than 100,000 ahadith. Uh, so he examined more than 100,000 ahadith with complete chain of narrators. And out of that, he has selected anywhere from 4,000 to 4,500 ahadith. There is difference in opinion among, among scholars. And in one translation, I saw that the last translated hadith was numbered 4341. Four, so if that is a Sahih translation of his Sahih, then he has about 4,341 uh, uh, hadith um, classified in 37 books. And this book does not relate to fiqh only, jurisprudence, Islamic law, how to perform, what to do, but also interpretation of Akida dreams, uh, sorry, interpretation of dreams on Akida, abstinence, on trials and tribulations. So it is not uh, fully a sunan. <laughs> To majority of scholars, the book of Ibn Majah should hold the sixth position. There are other candidates for the sixth position. Uh, but to majority of scholars, this should hold the sixth position due to the availability of the variety of ahadith which were relied upon by the earlier Muhaddithun. This book contains about 1339 ahadith which are not available in any of the other five books. 1339. Ibn Hajar Askalani, author of Fath al-Bari, uh, the commentary on al-Bukhari's Sahih, commented that the book of Sunan Ibn Majah is very essential, is a very essential, ideal, and wide-ranging book. It contains numerous chapters and rare ahadith, and it also has many weak ahadith. And uh, weak hadith doesn't mean that we uh, throw them out. There is weakness in the chain of narration. Uh, a weak hadith could be an authentic hadith. We cannot say it is authentic. But if the weak hadith supports what we have in the Quran or in authentic hadith, then that weak hadith has value. Or if you have on a particular uh, uh, aspect, on a particular saying, you have few different weak hadith than to some scholars, and I'm saying some scholars, few weak hadith on a particular uh, issue becomes a Hassan hadith. Hassan means good, sound. It's not authentic, it doesn't become authentic, but becomes Hassan hadith. But by using a weak hadith, we cannot start uh, a, a new practice. We can only start a practice, establish a practice based on Quran and authentic hadith. So weak hadith doesn't mean it is uh, valueless. He added 482 new sahih ahadith, not in other five books. Includes 3002 ahadith that are common with the other five books but narrated with different channels of narration. And that's a great strength of his book. This multiplicity of chain of narration contains, uh, as I mentioned, 1339 ahadith that are not found in any of the other five books. 
And these additions are known as the wide. And because of these reasons, his Sunan has been elevated to the rank of sixth of the six. And the other thing that he does that I did not uh, quote here is that he gives in his chain of narration, not only the name of the narrator, but also the town or the place that the narrator comes from, from which one uh, Hadith expert can uh, make a determination whether two narrators in the chain were one after another could have met or not. Commendations about Ibn Majah, there are many commendations. I, I will quote only three of them. Imam al-Dahabi, I've, I've used him in for every Imam <clears throat> in the commendation of every Imam. Imam. He says, Imam Ibn Majah remembered Ahadith by heart. That was the case with every of the uh, six, uh, five other five Imams. He was a critic in the field of Hadith, sciences, truthful, upright, and a man of wide learning, and something that goes with every one of the uh, six uh, Imams. In Tadkiratul Hufaz, Ad Dahabi writes, he was a great memorizer of a Hadith and a Hadith scholar and Quran uh, uh, Mufassir of Kazvin. Abu Yala al-Khalili said he was a very trustworthy and an authority and had a deep knowledge of the Hadith sciences. Just three out of many commendations. The Imam died on Monday, 22nd Ramadan, 273 Hijri, when he was about 64. And these ages that I'm giving you are based on the, uh, the uh, Hijri, uh, the lunar calendar. May Allah Ta'ala shower his choicest blessings on the Iman, uh, on the Imam. Ameen. Many a poet wrote moving words on his death. And uh, one of the uh, great poets of Kazwin, uh, Muhammad bin Aswad Kazwini wrote, the loss of Iba, Ibn Majah weakened the columns of the throne of knowledge and he shook up its pillars. And uh, by the way, when I looked at the most famous people from Kazvin, uh, I, 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 to me it occurred that Ibn Majah was the most famous among the illustrious sons of Kazvin. This is something I showed you when we talked about the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam uh, Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, their yeah. birth, their death, birth and place, death and place, their lifespan, their origin. Uh, where did the, uh, what, what is their origin? Place of, uh, place of uh, origin. Uh, where they travel to. Their books, as far as I could get, uh, major books, their teachers, major teachers, most famous teachers, and their most famous students. And uh, one thing to note is, uh, is Imam Malik is from Medina. He was born there. And it is mentioned that he went for Hajj once. Other than that, he was in Medina. In, and he collected hadith from all, all whom he got in Medina or all who traveled through Medina. But uh, other than him and Imam Shafi, who is, uh, who is uh, known to be uh, of Arab origin, his, his tribe is from, uh, from Hijaz area. Uh, Abu Hanifa is from Persia. Uh, and, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he also is an Arab. Banu Duhul is uh, an Arab tribe. So we can say among the four Imams, only Abu, Imam Abu Hanifa is, is a non-Arab. And the other thing to note is uh, in their troubles, they did not trouble as much as these four uh, uh, Imams of the four schools. They did not trouble as much as uh, the uh, six imams of the six uh, authentic books 
uh, troubled. And uh, Imam Abu Hanifa started, uh, he was born in 70 Hijri. Uh, and uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was born in 164 Hijri. So there's a difference of about 100 years between these four Imams. But if you look at, and, and this is something that I, it took me quite a bit of time to prepare, to summarize in one table about this, the uh, four Imams and the six Imams of the six schools, uh, of the six uh, canonical books, uh, using the same uh, uh, set of information, birthplace, death place, origin, troubles, books, major books, book, uh, teacher, uh, most famous teachers, most famous students. Uh, the thing to note is that uh, and on the next page, we I have the, the other two Imams. But none of them are Arabs. Uh, there, there are one or two of them who are from Arab tribes who settled in Persia, for example. Uh, but none of them are uh, were born in Arabia in Hejaz, basically. It was all Muslim territory, uh, needless to say. They were born all in the huge Muslim land, uh, but their origin is other than uh, pure Arab, <clears throat> which uh, should remind us of the saying of Rasulullah in his last Hajj, that an Arab is not superior to a non-Arab, or in, neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab. Uh, you are superior to Allah based on your taqwa. That, that's the basic uh, saying. So here you have contribution, tremendous contribution from uh, imams from other lands. Uh, it's all Muslim land, but uh, they were uh, basically non-Arabs. Uzbekistan um, for Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim Persian, Abu Dawud Persian, An Nasai, Turkmenistan, uh, Tirmizi, Uzbekistan, uh, Ibn Majah, Persian. I did not mention their troubles. I will talk about their troubles in my summary. It's so many places. Uh, it's uh, difficult to put uh, in every of these uh, cells. And um, because of the Mongols, we don't know much about the number of books they, have, they had written. Uh, many of them were destroyed and their major works, Sahih, uh, all of them uh, are considered to be Sahih for Imam Bukhari and Muslim, no weak hadith. Uh, Imam Abu Dawud, uh, very few. Uh, Imam An Nasai, uh, a little more. Tirmizi, a little more and Ibn Majah a little more in terms of uh, the number of weak hadith and uh, uh, their, their uh, most famous teachers, uh, Ibn Hanbal for Bukhari and Bukhari for Muslim and uh, uh, Abu Dawud for an nasai and Bukhari Muslim and Abu Dawud for Tirmizi and Abu Dawud for Ibn Majah, the most famous uh, uh, teachers and uh, the most famous students uh, for Bukhari, it was Muslim and Abu Dawud. And for Muslim, it was Abu Dawud and Nasai. For An Nasai, it was Tabarani, a famous scholar. And uh, for the other two, Tirmizi and Ibn Majah, uh, I couldn't find anybody that you would recognize. And then I wanted to uh, report about few more reputed scholars, but for the sake of time, I will not go over them. I normally post these in our um, group, uh, WhatsApp group. Uh, so you will find, if you want to read, you will find there. So I'll simply mention Ad-Duhli, uh, we talked about him. Uh, Ibn Majah was a student of Ad-Duhli. Imam Bukhari went to Nishapur when Ad-Duhli was the most famous scholar. Ad-Darimi is another famous name, Abu Hatim Ar-Razi, Abu Zura Ar-Razi, uh, and one, one uh, Orientalist compared 
uh, Razi as as a as a close uh, um, scholar uh, with with as much or or nearly as much uh, um, uh, uh, reputation as Bukhari. So that's why I mentioned him, Abu Zura Ar Razi, and, and then the the one above him is Abu Hatim Ar Razi from Tehran. Ray means Tehran. And uh, so they start from 170 uh, Hijri. And uh, I have, I've given the list based on their year of birth, Abu Yala, and then Al Bazar, Ibn Khuzayma, At Tabarani, Ibn Hibban, Ad Darkutni, we mentioned him, me, and then uh, Tawheed in the previous uh, session in terms of the 28th hadith in Imam Nabavi's book of 40 hadith. And then Al-Hakim Nishapuri, Bayhaki, Abu Al-Yala, Al-Mundiri, Al-Dahabi, about whom, uh, from whom I have quoted uh, to, uh, as commendation or, or um, commending all the six scholars. And he was an encyclopedia of Islam, this Ad Dhabi, born in 651 Hijri. And he's traveled to so many places. And, and by the way, these scholars increased the number of authentic hadith for us and brought for us many weak hadith. And as I said, when you have a number of weak hadith on a particular topic, then that topic or that set of weak hadith makes the topic or, or makes the subject, uh, elevates it to, to something called Hassan sound or, or good. So I, I go over what I say in the introduction again, because uh, there are so many of us or some of us who join who cannot join from the beginning, so that they can know what we are talking about. So today is the 10th session on Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the first uh, two sessions, I talked about the paramount importance of Sunnah. In the third one, on the painstaking process of uh, verifying authentic hadith, the painstaking process that was adopted by the four Imams and the six Imams of the six sahihs, what was the painstaking process they undertook? So I, I gave a rundown of that. And then I talked about the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence uh, and uh, the scholars involved and uh, the trouble that they went through. And uh, um, what was the criteria uh, that they adopted in uh, their school of jurisprudence? the fourth and the fifth sessions, and the sixth, why difference in the four schools, primarily because of the difference in criteria. In the seventh session about Imam Bukhari, in the eighth one on Imams Muslim and Abu Daud, in the ninth one on, on Imams An nasai and At-Tirmizi, and today on Imam Ibn Majah, and I will take a little extra time because I want to finish off everything. Otherwise, you know, something is left and then I have to do it in the next session. Or, or maybe, I'm still debating what to do. <clears throat> it is 41 and today we have special dua. So my uh, gut feeling tells me that I should do the summary in the next session. Anybody who wants to know the summary, uh, please join in the next session. But I'll take just a few minutes to talk about the summary uh, for those who do not want to join in the next session. Summary of what we have discussed in terms of the four imams from the four schools of thought and the six imams from the six of the six canonical uh, books. They lived from 70 AH or 70 Hijri to 303 Hijri. The first one, Imam Abu Hanifa and the, uh, the last one, Imam Ibn Majah died in 303 age, uh, Hijri. Their learning was not easy for them. They traveled from place to place. 
and I've only named the general area, not the individual cities, it would be a big list. Hejaz, Sham, Hejaz includes Makkah, Medina, and other cities like Taif. Sham includes uh, Syria, Palestine, Jordan. Uh, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, there's one more, Lebanon, and, uh, and present-day Israel. Iraq, there are a number of cities, Damascus, Kufa, Basra, and other uh, cities where there were scholars. Uh, Egypt, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it includes, but uh, primarily Cairo and Fustat. Khurasan, number of cities in Khurasan, which today comprises uh, at least uh, five or seven countries, Uzbekistan, Turkestan, part of Iran, Afghan, part of Afghanistan, and uh, part of Iraq, uh, and so on and so forth, Khurasan area. So uh, all these combined together would form in today's terms about 20 countries. They traveled in all these places. Bukhari, and there is some uh, research that I did. Uh, I found a map which showed the places he went to. And then I found, uh, found uh, uh, I calculated the distances and then I totaled them. And then he says he went to certain places two times or four times or a number of times. So that is not included in that map. So then I extrapolated. And the minimum I find in terms of his travel or travels is 20,000 kilometers, maybe 25,000 kilometers or 12,500 miles if it is uh, 20,000 kilometers, which is uh, half of the globe. And if you travel four kilom uh, 40 kilometers per day, it would take you 500 days to travel 20,000 kilometers. And uh, he traveled for 15 years, of which, you know, uh, uh, one and a half years went in travel. And these are the different places he traveled to from which I calculated the distances and, and I added them up and then uh, extrapolated based on the number of times he visited Baghdad or Basra, as he himself says, or Kufa, or he went a couple of times to Egypt. Uh, so, um, and, and he went uh, a few times to Makkah and Medina. So it would be 20,000 kilometers to 25,000 kilometers. And they started their journeys as young as 15, as young as 15, for Al-Bukhari and Nisai to uh, 22 for Ibn Majah. And they traveled for 15 or more years, gathered and memorized hundreds and of thousands of ahadith. They were, they were um, encyclopedic in their memory, uh, in their knowledge. And they, were, they, were, uh, they had photographic memory. And in the absence of computers, they acted as human computers. They were not only hafiz of Ahadith, but they were also Hafiz of Quran, each one of them. And they fulfilled the prophetic uh, prophecy that very soon will people beat the flanks of camels in search of knowledge. Very soon people will beat the flanks of camels in search of knowledge. And Rasulullah said this when Islam was in its infancy. And he's saying that people would start traveling from one place to another in search of knowledge. <clears throat> so uh, the other learnings, uh, I think I'll present, uh, I will present in the next uh, session uh, and then get into some of the daily sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let me conclude by saying that in the golden age that we were talking about, these, uh, all these people, they lived in what is known as the golden age of science and civilization. But this was also golden age of hadith and knowledge. So uh, for, for the people for whom Historians call it a golden age. They were involved 
in making great strides in medicine and sciences and geography, in astronomy, in history, that is making sense of Allah's creation and creating conveniences for the benefit of man. And this group, by the way, those who were involved in, in dunya, in uh, making sense of Allah's creation and creating conveniences, they were not devoid of deen. And we, and I'm talking about we, fall loosely in the second group because we are, we are not involved so, so much in knowledge by and large in the second group. And among those in our group who are involved in dunya, <laughs> there are people who have utter disregard of deen, Islam, and there are some who are fortunate to get a marginal understanding of deen. And uh, the conclusion that I wanted to make, and I didn't get time to go through, uh, I'm starting with point number 32. So uh, from point number one to 31, I, I got time to talk about only five or six of them. I didn't get time to get into the others. So the conclusion I wanted to make is we need to get back to deen, not be involved solely in dunya. And not the deen we understand, but the deen brought by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because we don't have a choice. We have to die. We will be resurrected. There's no doubt about that. And we will have to give account of our deeds. Every moment of our existence in this life, we have to give account of that. There's no if and but in that. And the accomplishments of the four Imams and the six uh, authors of Siya Sitta, plus thousands of scholars. Now you will be amazed at how many people were involved in this process. And this opened up my way, uh, my eyes actually. And I, I as I said in, in one conclusion that I feel fortunate that before I die, uh, I have been able to know about some of these illustrious sons of Islam and the extreme hardship they went through. What they went through and collected for us, we have at our fingertips. Their accomplishments made, makes it possible for us to follow the pristine deen lived by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is their contribution for generations to come after them. We not only have to practice, but also be examples for others. And the best way to attract others is through acquiring the enlightened qualities, prophetic qualities of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is known as Husnul Khuluq. And this is the last slide. So we have to learn the, otherwise how do we practice and how do we exemplify? You know, these, uh, one point I should make before ending is that these uh, scholars, they learned not only knowledge, but they also learned adab, etiquettes, beautiful character, beautiful behavior from their teachers. Our teachers give lectures and they leave. We don't see them, but they lived with their teachers and they learned worship from their teachers. What is real worship? What is real taqwa, iman? What is real uh, uh, character? They learned from their teachers, from the examples of their teachers. We learned some know-how, but not uh, how to live, not how to deal with people not how to practice on the, uh, uh, based on the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for us, it would be taking a 180 degree turn and it is not easy. Old habits do not die, but that sacrifice of making 180 degree turn has its own benefits in the year after. 
the rewards of being able to change during the time of corruption is unimaginable. In one narration, which I have on the next slide, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that they will get at the time of, uh, during the time of corruption, whoever acts on my uh, sunnah, when people are discarding my sunnah, whoever acts on my sunnah, they will get the reward of 50, uh, 50 of 50 persons. And the Sahaba asked, 50 of them or 50 of us? And he said, 50 of you. They will get the reward of 50 of you. And the choice is ours. Uh, uh, उच्चारण करते गैक्सिमाम लोके भूल करी उच्चारण करते गए मुखस्तिकल लाइक मैक्सिमाम समय कुलहु अल्लाह कथा कुलहु नाम वार्ड ही नहीं आसले जख पढ़ी उच्चारण शुद्ध उच्चारण बोलना शुद्ध उच्चारण पढ़तेबिक अर्थ करते जायटार अर्थ लाम वालदा हम जन्म देवा लाम हम का जन्म दें थिंग Normally, children take birth from their parents, and children are actually a part and parcel of their parents. And why people take children? 
people take children for a host of reasons, like that the children will help the parents in their old age, they will help them in their necessity, to eradicate their sufferings, and above all, to continue with the future generations. Now, Allah is free from all these. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from all these necessities. So he has no requirement of our children. And Allah is eternal. There is no beginning, no end of Allah. So there is no question that Allah will take birth from someone. That's why this ayat says that Allah has never given birth to anyone and he has not taken birth from anyone. Allah does not need any help from anyone because he is free from all these needs. He doesn't need to maintain his future generation because he is eternal. So he neither has parent nor has children. So there's the this ayat and the last ayat walam yakullahu Kufuan, aha. Walam, lam is a separate word. Yakun lahu, yakun and lahu. These are the two words have been idgam and become yakun lahu. So walam, yakun lahu, kufuan, aha. The straight meaning of this, this ayat is that there is nothing like him. If you just go that there is nothing like him or there is nothing which is equivalent to him. So there is nothing uh, that is like him uh, or there is nothing that resembles him from amongst his creatures. Everything Allah has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is nothing out of his creatures that resembles him or that is like him. Nothing like him in terms of his entity. Nothing is like him in terms of his characteristics. Nothing is like him in terms of his names and in terms of his deeds. So from any aspect, there is nothing that is equivalent to him or that is like him amongst his creatures. He is full of baraka and from all sorts of deficiency. There is no deficiency in him. He observes everything and, to everything and there is nothing like him. There will be nothing like him. There had not been anything like him. So there is the very short parjama of these two last ayah. And with that, I complete my and inshallah, in the next session, uh, I will talk about uh, Surah Falak. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <laughs> কিন্তু এই এই সূরা দুটার কিন্তু একটু নিয়ত চেঞ্জ করলে কিন্তু আবার অনেক রিওয়ার্ড পাওয়া সম্ভব এবং নিয়তটা এরকম হতে পারে একটা হচ্ছে যে এই সূরা ইখলাস তো বেসিক্যালি হচ্ছে ইয়ে নিয়ে তাওহিদ নিয়ে আর সূরা কাউসার হচ্ছে রাসূলুল্লাহ সাল্লাল্লাহু আলাইহি ওয়াসাল্লামের অনার নিয়ে মানে আমরা যদি খুবই আর কি মানে একদম ডাইলুট করে বলি আর কি এই দুইটার ব্যাপারে একদম বেসিক ইয়েতে গিয়ে তো আমরা যদি আমাদের আল্লাহর প্রতি লাভ এবং রাসূলুল্লাহ প্রতি লাভ এই দুইটাকে যদি আমরা মেইন নিয়া ধরে যদি আমরা এই এই সূরা দুটো পড়ি সেই ক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু উই গেট এ লট অফ রিওয়ার্ড এই ছোট সূরাগুলা পড়েও আর সূরা ইখলাসের এমনিতেই নেই ইট হ্যাজ ইট হ্যাজ এ লট অফ বারাকা সেটা তো আমরা জানি Uh, it is uh, uh, said to be one third of the Quran. Even later, near the other, on a on a on a explanation, yes. But uh, whatever uh, that might be, 
জাস্ট এইভাবে যদি আমরা চিন্তা করে এই সুরা দুটা পড়ি আমাদের নামাদের সময় আই থিং উই গেট সাম এক্সট্রা बेनिफिट्स আউট অফ ইট এইটা তো एक्चुअली হাদিসেও আছে আমরা দুটো সুরা সুরা কাউসার তো আছে এর বাইরে সুরা কাফিরুন আর সুরা ইখলাস এই দুইটাই একটা হচ্ছে আমরা কাফেরদেরকে নিগেট করা আর কাফিরুনের মাধ্যমে আর এটার মাধ্যমে আমরা আল্লাহ মানে আইডেন্টিটিটাকে সাক্ষরতার সাক্ষ্য দেওয়া তো দুটো দুটো সুরা আবার এইটাই আবার মানে কম্বাইন করে তো বহু জায়গায় আমাদের इवन হজের বিভিন্ন জায়গায় নামাজের যে হাদিস গুলো আছে সেখানেও এই দুটো সুরা পড়ার জন্য আপনার গিয়ে করা আছে কি বলে রেকমেন্ড করা আছে थैंक यू मेडिकल इश्यूज मिसेस मस्कुर आयुब अंडर गोइंग ट्रीटमेंट Lutfi Ayub of second batch, Abul Barkat from sixth batch, battling cancer. Panna, sixth batch, undergoing dialysis. Mrs. Mahfuz Reza, battling cancer. Mahfuz from sixth batch. Abdul Rauf from thirteenth batch. Saif's father-in-law, battling cancer. Saif from nineteenth batch. Jahangir, from twenty-fourth batch. who underwent uh, who had uh, kidney transplant in wasi's mother she has uh, multiple problems uh, including dialysis need for dialysis may allah taala grant shifa to all of them amirul faisal from 19 batch uh, paralyzed for about 6 years mustafiz noble fighting cancer 19 batch colonel aftab from 14 batch his wife he, he died during the bdr massacre uh, he was murdered uh, his wife is battling cancer farooq from 15 batch needs liver transplant he is in india uh, may allah taala make it easy for him grant him shifa abul musa has neurological uh, complications he underwent surgery uh, about uh, 10 days ago may allah taala grant him shifa abir's father mr mohammed ali reza undergoing dialysis and naimur rahman from 46 batch neurological complications since the time he graduated from uh, rachai cadet college 6 years ago uh, namur is from 46th batch may allah grant him shifa shopnil from 51st batch he graduated 1 year ago and uh, he has cancer if i've missed anybody allah knows may allah grant shifa and our relatives who are sick may allah grant shifa our near and dear ones and friends who are suffering <coughs> may allah grant shifa all those from our fraternity who passed away may allah grant shifa all those from our family our relatives our parents our uh, forefathers may allah grant them jannatul firdaus and make their grave a garden of jannatul firdaus and may allah taala grant to iqbal mehdi credit number 113 he has gone his credit number remains may allah taala shower his choicest blessings on him in his grave make it a garden of jannatul firdaus fill it with noor expand his grave 
grant him shade under the arch on the day of judgment, enable him to cross the bridge with the wink of an eye and grant him Jannatul Firdos without reckoning. Uh, some of his friends are here, I mean batchmates, we are all his friends and uh, they may like to talk about him. He has died, but they can enliven him for us in our memory. So we will do that after the dua. And after that, uh, Ambassador Major General Jangir Kabir Talukdar will make a presentation on some verse of the Quran <clears throat> or ayat or some of the ayat. For Iqbal Mehdi, I remember him very much. Two years my junior, he was a great uh, athlete and he was a very good student, otherwise he could not be an engineer. <clears throat> uh, he was uh, a bedrock for Khaled House in terms of bringing uh, points. <clears throat> I remember his face of, uh, of 55 years ago, 56 years ago. Uh, for him, we recite Surah Fatiha once and Surah Ikhlas three times, and then we will get into the next uh, uh, part, which is uh, Dua. Auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. R-Rahman r-Rahim. Maliki yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim. Ghayr al-maktub alayhim wa latonin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kun huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kun huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kun huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, jazallahu anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahu ahluhu. Subhana Rabbi al-Ali al-Ala al-Wahhab, subhana Allahi wa bihamdihi, adada khalqi, wa rila nafsi, wa zinata arshi, wa midada kalimatihi. La ilaha illallah al-Halim al-Kareem, subhana Allahi Rabbi al-Arshi al-Azim, wa alhamdulillahi Rabbi al-Alameen, wa saluka mujibati, rahmatika, wa zaima magfiratika, wa ghanimata min kulli birri, wa salamata min kulli ifm, la tada lana zamban illa ghafartahu. ولا من إلا فرشته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا دينا إلا كذيته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا مزدما إلا نصرته ولا مسلما إلا رحمته ولا حاجة إلا كريزا إلا كذيته يا رحم الرحيمين يا رحم الرحيمين يا رحم الرحيمين اللهم أصلك من خير ما صلك منه نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استأذنك منه نبيك Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Antal Mustan wa alaykal balag wa la hawla wa la kuwata illa billahi la liya la azim wa allahu maghfir li wa li walidana wa jamil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat ala hiyai minhum wal amwat inna ka mujibu da'wat bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatum wa fi al-akhirati hasanatum wa kina azaban nara ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا كرة عيون وجعلنا للمتقين إماما رب جعلني مكيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء يا ذو الجلال والإكرام يا ذو الجلال والإكرام يا ذو الجلال والإكرام ألف لام ميم لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم ألف لام ميم لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم ألف لام ميم لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين وإلهكم إله واحد لا إله إلا هو الرحمن الرحيم يا مالك الملك يا ذو الجلال والإكرام يا عزيز الجبار المتكبر يا خالق الباري المصور أنت وليف يا فاتر السماوات والأرض أنت وليف الدنيا والآخرة والله 
Well, uh, whatever Tofik you have given us to say a little bit about you and your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and some of your illustrious, illustrious Abd. Well, uh, you rectify all the shortcomings, Allah, of our saying and hearing and worshiping Allah and reciting. And you accept all of it, Allah. <coughs> well, uh, you accept all of it, Allah. You are the most gracious, most merciful. And you forgive all our sins, Allah. Oh, Allah. We, we fall for so short, Allah. We do not have the ability to stand before you or talk about you, or listen about you, or <coughs> worship you. You have given us the tawfiq, Allah, by your grace and mercy, Allah. You, you accept us, Allah. You forgive our sins and you accept us, Allah. And you give us, you grant us the understanding, Allah. First and foremost, the understanding about our responsibilities towards you and our responsibilities towards our fellow human beings, Allah, and enable us to practice on those responsibilities. Give us the the husn husnul khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so that we can meet our responsibilities to fellow human beings and those we have harmed and hurt. Uh, you for you you uh, compensate them from your side, Allah, so that they forgive us, Allah, and we are saved from doom on the day of judgment, Allah. Enable us to remember you in all conditions, Allah, and enable us to worship you in all conditions, Allah. Well, we have spent our entire life pursuing dunya, Allah, and now we are at the fag end of our life, many of us, Allah. You, Allah, you give us, you accept us and give us the right understanding and the right, and, and put us on siratul mustaqim, Allah, and enable us to do everything solely for your pleasure, Allah, and for, for your love and, and the love of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa Allah. You accept us, Allah. Our heart doesn't want Allah. Shaitan, we are under, under attack from shaitan, attack from our, our base desires, our nafsaniyat. Uh, we are under attack from dunya. We are under attack from, from people who are under the influence of shaitan. Allah, you protect us from them every moment. Do not leave us for the wink of an eye to these forces, Allah. You hold our hand, Allah and enable us to cross this very tumultuous journey of life, Allah, very slippery journey of life, Allah. We are weaklings, Allah. Oh, Allah, we do not have the requisite knowledge even, Allah. We have some knowledge of dunya, but no, not, very little knowledge or no knowledge of deen, Allah, and no appreciation of deen, Allah. Oh, Allah, that whatever you have, you have commanded for us, Allah, you have done for our benefit in dunya, and for Akhira, we don't appreciate that. We don't realize that. We feel we are something uh, after having acquired a bit of the wing of a mosquito. The world does not have value to you equal to the wing of a mosquito. We have acquired a bit of that and we feel we are something, Allah. We are nothing, absolutely nothing, Allah. And we don't realize that. That's the tragedy. Uh, may, Make it possible that we do not leave the world in that condition, Allah, in that condition of heart and deeds, Allah. Oh, Allah, hold our hand and, and, uh, and uh, enable us to cross this journey of life such that you are pleased with us, such that we can die with kalama in our tongue and uh, can save ourselves from the waswas of shaitan at the point of death. He will try, Allah, the last time so that we can get your best behavior in your dealings, your best dealings in cover and hasher and on the day of in crossing the bridge and in entering Jannah to those. Well, uh, well, uh, whatever, whatever we have been able to recite Allah and whatever we have been able to gather in terms of this obligatory act of uh, acquiring ilm Allah, the blessings of that convey to Iqbal Mahdi and uh, Allah, you forgive his sins, all his sins, Allah. Expand his grave. Oh, Allah, fill his grave with noor. Oh, Allah, make his grave a garden of paradise. He was such a beautiful person. 
that I remember across time. And he remained beautiful as I hear from our brothers until he passed away to you. May he see your best dealings, Allah. Oh Allah, and elevate his status in grave every day. And you exhibit similar dealings with our, all our near and dear ones, our parents, our forefathers, our relatives, our, our teachers, our principals, our, our friends who are, who, are, who are with you, Allah. Oh, Allah, expand their grave, Allah. Make it a garden of paradise. And uh, give them on the day of judgment shade under the arsh. Make their hisab easy. And give their book of deeds in their right hand, Allah. And enable them to remain worry-free on that, on that tumultuous day, Allah. And enable them to cross the bridge of Sirat with the speed, with the wink of an eye, Allah. And enable them to enter Jannat of Ferdos without any reckoning, oh Allah. Oh Allah, we could not tolerate any of their trouble in this world. How can we tolerate if they are in trouble in the next world? And how can they be in trouble in trouble in the next world when you are the most gracious and most merciful, Allah? <laughs> you forgive them, Allah. <laughs> Grant them mercy. Enable them to live under the shade of your mercy, Allah. And you enable us to live under the shade of your mercy and blessings and rahma and magfira and hidayat, Allah. Accept us, Allah. The key is your acceptance, Allah. <laughs> Everything will become easy, Allah, if you accept us, Allah. What is in our heart, you know. You accept them, Allah. If something is, if something is harmful for us in this dunya, give us in the next life, Allah. We are in various types of uh, trials and tribulations. Please remove those trials and tribulations from us, Allah. Enable us to lead a life of Hayatun Tayyaba. Give us the good life in this world and in the hereafter. Oh Allah, those of us who are in uh, various afflictions are ailing in different ways. You protect them, preserve them, grant them shifa, and grant them good health with Iman and Amil Saliha. Wallah, wallah, we cannot ask equal to your might and majesty. You grant us blessings equal to your might and majesty. Fit dunya wal akhira. We cannot ask protection from you equal to your might and majesty. Wallah, you protect us equal to your might and majesty. Allahumma inna kafuun. If every one of us, if every one of mankind enters Jannah, there will be no sh shortfall on your side, Allah. And if everybody of mankind enters hellfire, you will not be benefited in any way, Allah. Enable us to enter the garden of paradise. Ya kazi ul hajat, ya rafiyat darajat, ya halal al mushkilat, ya mujibud dawat, bay rahmatik an asla ghis, ya wadal awalin, ya akhir al akhirin, ya akram al akramin, ya rahm al rahimin, ya rahim al masakin, ya zil kuwat al matin, rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samiyul alim, wa tugu alayna inna kanta tawab al rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun, wa salamun ala al mursalim, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wahabdillah, Allah, Illallah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rabbil